Hey everybody, it is Dean Z speaking to you once again from my basement, just like during the high pandemic era. Um, I'm doing a, an application reading today and that really doesn't work in the law school. One, so I had to do a little filming from home and it takes about twice as long to set up my camera, my video uh, stuff on the phone as it does to actually do the app reading. And then poor Mr. Dean Z is uh, trapped upstairs. I've told him he's not allowed to walk because it creates too much noise. So this obviously is not going to go on too long because, you know, can't can't hold the, the old husband hostage forever. Okay, today I am going to do an application reading, as I said, and to the one we have selected is someone who has strong academic indicators, strong metrics, uh, but who we ended up denying from a past application cycle. And I thought that might be useful to all of you to see, you know, what is it that takes someone who's on, you know, if you just know the little synopsis of their uh, materials, you might think, wow, that person's going to be getting in all over the place. And at least at Michigan, um, I found it not a good application for admitting and i don't think i would be alone in this so hopefully this will shed some light for you as you're preparing your materials uh, about things to avoid and, and the way things come off uh when you are a stranger reading someone's materials because that's the trick like you are you're introducing yourself to the application to the admissions team rather they don't know you at all so little things are going to carry extra weight because we only have a certain amount of information about you. And so, you know, the impressions I get from this application may all be misimpressions, but that is what, you know, I'm ho hopefully going to help you avoid creating misimpressions. All right. So, um, when I am reading files at home, uh, in past application reads, I've done used paper, but I'm going to do what I do in real life, which is read them on my laptop. And I get a list of information, name of the person, undergraduate institution, LSAT and GPA. And so I do look at that. I know in my head, you know, that little bit of information about the person before I get started reading. Um, but the first thing I look at is not the information about their LSAT and their undergraduate record, but their application materials and their essays. So that's the first document I have pulled up here. And so let's just dive right in. Okay, so one thing jumps out at me as I'm scrolling along here. Not, not a lot of information, as I've said in past episodes, not a lot of information in the application that is, you know, particularly interesting from the file reader's point of view. But one little tidbit that jumps out at me, and so let me share it, is that he is from one part of the country, the Northeast, and he is going to school in a very different part of the country. Uh, at a big public institution that is very well regarded. Uh, so that's just interesting. It tells me, okay, this is someone who is, you know, not afraid of leaving home, um, you know, a little adventurous. So that's like a tiny little bit of information, but is in my head like, oh, that's positive. Um, and now I'm scrolling a little bit further. We do ask people to tell us every time they've taken um, the LSAT and he says he's taken it twice. So, okay, good to know. We'll, we'll get into that when we get to his law school report. Um, and then we also ask for family information. And I can see here, he mentions that he has a mom with a graduate degree. And then he mentions that he has a father, but doesn't say anything about his father. Doesn't tell me, uh, we ask, you know, is this guardian or parent deceased? What's the address? What's their primary occupation? what's their level of education. He doesn't give us any of that information and that is a little, you know, mystifying. I, I don't love that. I, I don't know whether that means I'm not in touch with my father, he's not part of my life, or whether it means uh, I'm just not gonna fill out this answer. So now this is, again, this is the tiniest bit of information. It's not going to make a difference uh, in his application, but it's painting a portrait. So just, just be aware of that. And if you have a parent with whom you're just not in touch and you don't wanna 
give any information because they're just not part of your life, that's then I would just not mention it. I just wouldn't even put an entry in for that. Just put in whatever parent who has been your, you know, custodial parent, the person you um, rely on as a parent and leave off the other person. Because what the way this got answered just creates a question and um, a little bit of uncertainty in my mind. And the conclusion I'm drawing, just to be very clear, is that he just didn't feel like answering the question. Again, that could be wrong, but that's the, that's the impression that's being created. Now I can see, we ask that you list all educational institutions attended. I can see that he attended not just the school, the public institution I mentioned where he is currently studying, but also another um, uh, community college is the word I'm looking for. So, okay, so we'll read about that. Uh, or look for information about that as we go through, just filing that away. Um, I, I actually have a real fondness for people who uh, start out in community college and then transfer to a four-year college before applying. I think that that shows some um, tenacity, some ambition, some, you know, just all good character traits, right? This is someone who is striving. I like that. It's a little bit of a harder path. I think, and so uh, then just starting out at a four-year institution. So I like that. Okay, now we are at the resume, uh, which is the first real substantive part of the materials that I'm looking at here. Uh, and I will note that at the very top, it, he has given us an objective, which I is not necessary. I've said that in other uh, videos, and I don't tend to love it. It's just sort of a waste of space. I'm not sure. Uh, what it adds. It's here it is. Sometimes people will say um, that they are, their objective is to get a certain kind of job, which I always think is sort of hilarious, like you're applying to law school, so don't tell me you want a different kind of job because you're using the wrong resume. He does not do that, but he, it's still not helpful. It says, I'm looking for a career in law in a corporate setting. Um, it just doesn't add anything, and it's, it's just vague, so I, better to leave that off. Okay. This shows that at this institution that he is currently in, so he is applying to start law school, you know, the same year that he's graduating from college, um, which is totally fine, obviously. But it does mean that, you know, I'll be looking for evidence that, you know, of why he's applying to law school, what made him choose law school, has he put thought into it, is, or has he on a bit of a treadmill that seems like, okay, this is, you know, the easiest path. So we'll be looking for that information. It says he's a sports management major. Um, so maybe he wants to be sports agent, combine sports and law. Maybe not. Let's just file that away. Okay, now we get down to the work experience and it's, it's, not, uh, it's not great. Uh, he has had jobs, he only lists jobs that he's had in the summer, in the summers, which suggests that, you know, that he hasn't been working during the school year, uh, which is certainly not mandatory. But again, if you're applying straight through from undergrad, you want to have made as much u positive use of your time as possible. So, you know, maybe that's um, extracurriculars during the school year, or maybe it's jobs, or uh, it could be a lot of different things. He is only showing jobs, and they're only part-time jobs, which I do appreciate that he's telling me how many hours a week he's working, but he's working 20 hours a week. What's happening with the rest of the time? I don't know. And it's just not a lot of stuff. So it's a, as a coach, um, as a bartender, as a self-employed swim instructor, and then at the very end, it looks like at the very beginning of college, the first job he shows here is a, a summer position as an intern for a sole practitioner law office. And so he has bullet points talking about what he did. He has it for all of those, but of course I know just sort of intuitively what a bartender does, what a self-employed swim instructor does. But for the intern in the law office, he's, he gives bullet points that are not illuminating. So if you're gonna do bullet points, you really need to make them, you know, this is, this is real estate that you need to make the most use of. So tell me something significant with this space. So it says one of the bullet points is categorizing years of cases, uh, creating Excel sheets, um, traveling across the state to deliver documents, and then 
this is the one that, so none of that is, you know, it's honest. I'm sure that is what he was doing, but you know, maybe you could dress it up a little or maybe dig deeper and think more about what skills you got out of this position um, that would be, you know, more uh, impressive or indicating that you've really put some thought into the legal profession. This is all very vague. And then he says, contributing to the conversation of different cases and addressing different problems as they arise. Two problems with that sentence. One, it's just, it's just a sen terrible sentence. It's, it's jumbled and, and isn't quite, it doesn't flow. And then it's also very vague. I don't know what that means, like to contribute to, to the conversation of different cases and to address different problems. That just, you know, you'd be better left unsaid if that's, you know, do better than that. Okay, and finally, the only um, volunteer experience or extracurricular type of activity he lists is um, as a is with a political committee. I'm not going to name what political party he was with because I, I just it, I don't care, and I think it is it can be distracting for you as uh, the viewer or listener. But it shows that he worked with this political party for four years, starting in high school. So that's a long commitment. That's interesting. Although he stopped it two years ago which is, you know, if you're applying to law school and you're interested in politics, you'd think you'd still be doing that. So that's just a little, little question mark in my head. Um, and again, he has bullet points that are not helpful. So here are the two bullet points. Number one, leading by example to contact people who are not as passionate about a cause. I don't know what that means. Not as passionate as what? As he is? Um, okay, that's, I don't know. And then, Second bullet point, believing in what we are pursuing as a team and making appropriate decisions based on those beliefs. I just, I don't know what that means. I don't know who the we is. Uh, I don't know what the decisions are. I don't know what it is that they believe in. So I, my guess is this is somebody who didn't want to offend a reader by having a political view, but all it has done is create confusion in my mind and you know, it's, it sounds insincere. Like, I, does he really believe in these causes? I, I can't tell from what he's written. And finally, for skills and interests, he, again, um, it's it's not, it doesn't really reveal very much. So it says, um, fluent in Excel. I personally wouldn't use the word fluent to describe technology and or my, my skill set in technology. I might say expert or proficient or something like that, but not fluent. Um, because Excel is not a language, so it's just a program. And then years of experience with computers, doesn't say how many years, physically active, okay, communication skills, no description, like good communication skills, bad communication skills, good with children, nice, I like children, but not really relevant, so in it's so vague, it's it's not creating an interesting picture of him and it is also not like on point, which is, you don't always have to be on point at all, like, because I, I am interested in sort of the full picture of you. So it's not, I just would want to know more, like what does that mean to be good with children and politically active? Okay. Um, and now we get down to his personal statement. And in this, he pursues a metaphor where he is a caterpillar at the beginning and becomes a butterfly at the end. Don't love that. That is, you know, as, as metaphors go, um, it's a little trite. So, and then one of the problems of using a metaphor like that is that you, you know, it's, it's extended. He uses it throughout and that ends up usually getting kind of strained. It is the rare metaphor that is so perfect that you can really carry it through 10 paragraphs and have it still pertain well to that entire flow. So he starts out by saying that he was raised, you know, in this uh, community in the Northeast of the country that has one of uh, the highest poverty rates in the country. And he says, the people I grew up around were not only content with their situations, but they bullied those who wanted to do more. I have a couple of issues with this. One, if what he is saying is that the poor people uh, in, the par in the area where he grew up liked being poor, I question his reasoning and his judgment and why he thinks that. And he never really explains why he thinks that. And then 
that it does not jibe with my experience of humanity. And then to say they bullied those who wanted to do more, what he really means is they, he got bullied. Um, and again, if, if that's going to be the thing he talks about, fine. But then he really needs to explain that. And all he says is, I told them my ambitions and they didn't think I could carry them out. So, um, that's, uh, you know, that's, it doesn't, it, it doesn't, he doesn't make a strong case for bullying. And so I'm, I'm left thinking that he's being kind of dramatic here, right? Um, in his, in his description. So that's not a great start. And then he sort of walks a little bit, this caterpillar, you know, analogy keeps going on and he walks a little bit through his, um, resume, he talks about how he went to um, community college and said, he describes it this way, a below average quality of life was not the standard, but rather the target. Suggesting that people in community colleges want a below standard of life. Again, I don't know where he gets these ideas that there are, you know, that the people he is surrounded with who uh, haven't, you know, haven't had lives of great fortune and privilege want those lives. I'm not sure why he thinks that. Like maybe he, maybe the people he knew did, but then I need a little more detail because that is unusual. And so, uh, and then he says, I was trapped. And then he uses trapped metaphor several times to talk about how he's trapped in the cocoon of the caterpillar. And then he moves to, a, uh, from there to a story about um, an older relative who got a vaccine that um, caused him to, he had a bad reaction to the vaccine and um, he was hospitalized. And then, and then he talks about how he did not behave well during this period. He didn't go visit this relative. He didn't, um, and he used his situation to try to get other people to sympathize with him. But honestly, that's kind of what he's doing now. So he he talks about it and he sort of indicates that that is not, um, not admirable behavior. But I do not see, um, I do not see anything about how he has evolved past that. Um, he, he seems to feel guilty about it, but again, I, I and it sounds like it, it's, he's not very specific about the time, but as far as I can tell, it is pretty recent. So if, if something caused him to evolve and mature, great, but you really need to be specific about that. And it's also the tone is very dramatic. He talks about um, how this illness is horrific. Again, I'm not, he doesn't give enough details for me to understand why it's horrific. Not that you necessarily need to give me details about a horrific illness. In fact, uh, well, uh, you know, that could also be uh, very challenging to read on, on our end, but uh, so maybe you don't want to do that. But if you're going to use a word like horrific, I'd like a little context for how that, why, and, and he just doesn't provide that. And then it wraps up by talking about how um, they consulted a lawyer um, in order to sue because of the vaccine. And that is what made him interested in going to law school. And so then he, that's when he transferred from community college to the four-year college. And it really, it, that is just, it really doesn't hang together. And I know it is, I feel like it is hard when I'm describing this and you're, you're not reading it yourself, but it, that that's a story like if you wanted to do a this is what took me to law school story that that can be great but then you, you really have to make it you really have to help me understand how that took you to law school and he just isn't doing that now he also does an optional essay which is great because you know i as i'm not i'm you know right now i'm probably 80 percent on the way to thinking I'm going to deny because the, the resume wasn't good and then this essay wasn't good, but maybe the optional essay will be amazing 
and turn me around. That definitely happens. However, it doesn't in this case. First sentence is, I was trapped. Now you'll remember that in the personal statement, he also uses that trapped um, language. And so that's creating uh, an image for me of someone who just feels that he is being sort of acted upon and he doesn't have any autonomy. He doesn't have any ability to act himself. And that's not what I am looking for. I'm looking for someone who, who does feel like they are ready to take on the world and act on the world, not be just acted upon. And then the reason he was trapped, he says, is he's describing his experience at community college. And, you know, he, he describes it. Um, first of all, he uses second person. He says, you walk through residue covered glass doors and you are immediately patted down and fed through a metal detector. Um, you using second person, that is to say you is uh, not usually an effective way to write. It's, it's very distracting for the, for the person reading it because he should be saying I, it's, it's his experience or we maybe. Um, and he, he seems extremely angry about the metal detectors and so forth without exploring why the metal detectors might be necessary or expect it or, and also he, he doesn't seem to, uh, he seems to convey that everyone else seems fine with this situation, but he is the one person who realizes that it's not great. And, um, I don't know, you know, that, that, that seems to be a theme here too, that he, he thinks he is different, um, than those around him in, and it's not clear why he thinks that. And he, he definitely thinks, he seems to think that he is better, but not just different, like better than everybody else. Uh, without exploring why that might be and it just ends up it sounds arrogant and it sounds perhaps inaccurate too like i you know i i'm sympathizing with these other community college people who i don't know because i don't know there's something about the tone of this that just makes me want to be a little um oppositional um and quarrel with him okay so things aren't looking great for this candidate, but let us quickly now look at the law school report, which is where I will see more details about his testing history and his transcripts. So quickly, he he's told, remember, he said he took the LSAT twice. It turns out he took it three times. One was a cancel and he didn't say that. That is not a big deal, but I question like, what did you think I wouldn't see it? I, I don't know, why didn't you tell me that you took it three times? Not a big deal, but I'm already sort of in a, a mood to, as I say, to quarrel with this person. So I'm looking for things at this point. Took it once, got a 166, and then took it again and got a 172. That's a huge jump. Six points is a very significant jump, very unusual. And it went from the 90th percentile to the 98th percentile in his second take. And so with that kind of change, I would like to see a little bit of an explanation. It's only two months apart. So what changed there? What happened? Did something go wrong the first time? Um, did you not study? And then you did study for two months. That's pretty impressive if that's caused the jump. I, I, if you have anything to say about what the difference is, I'd love to know that. And I wish you'd told me. Next, we have the LSAT writing sample. Uh, I will not bore you by reading that, but I will say it's, uh, he, it's fine, like his, his writings, you know, technically is, is fine. He just does two paragraphs, um, which is very brief. And, you know, it does tell me that I think, you know, he is, um, you know, certainly a competent writer uh, in terms of his technological, his, sorry, he's a competent writer in terms of his technical skill set. Uh, that's really all I can get out of the LSAT writing sample. So I guess, from, you know, and I, I wish he'd written more though. It's like, he didn't really put much of an effort into it. Okay, now I'm looking at first his community college transcript and he got a 4.0, which is really impressive. Um, he took a variety of courses, history, government, that sort of thing. Um, algebra and uh, first aid. So he's taken a, a variety of things. I think he music appreciation. I think he was probably all over the 
uh, place um, in, in community college, which is fine. It's like, it's, it's the time to figure out what you want to do. So that's okay. And now we see his, the degree granting transcript. Um, he's, I mentioned he was a sport management major. He didn't take a lot of sort of academically demanding classes, frankly. Um, and it's not, so this is, he hasn't had work experience really that tells me why he's interested in law school. He's got this essay saying that this relative's illness put him on a path to law school, wasn't completely convincing. And now he has an undergraduate record that also doesn't really, he's not taking the kinds of classes that would prepare you very well for law school. Um, you know, classes where you have to do lots of reading and writing and, um, or, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of different ways to do your undergraduate record, um, to do your undergraduate education, I should say. Um, and you don't, certainly don't have to be a humanities major to be really ready for law school, but I'm just all together, like this is just feeding into the story that this, this person isn't really ready for law school. So now last thing to look at is the letters of rec. Now, to be very frank with you, at this point, um, I can't imagine a letter of recommendation that would turn me around, but I'll just take a look because I should, right? Uh, the first letter is from the attorney that he worked for as an intern at the very beginning of college, and it is one paragraph, and it describes, the first sentence says he worked here, uh, the second said we gave him a lot of different things, third sentence says here's the kind of things we got to do, we got him to do, and then the conclusion is he was eager to help and punctual and positive. Not a great, I mean that nothing about, you know, the quality of his work, nothing about, you know, whether he seemed bright and well suited for a career in law or anything like that. Uh, and now I'm suspecting that the person that he interned for may have been the person that they consulted with regard to filing a suit in connection with this older relative and the reaction to the vaccine. That's my guess. So, and then the last uh, letter of rec is from a professor and it too is extremely brief. Um, it's positive. It says, without reservation, I strongly recommend him for any law school. Um, but it is really lacking in detail. And, you know, it talks about, it says, one of his strongest attributes is his relentless engagement. Um, and then the writer doesn't really explain what that means. Um, just as, he completed all of his assignments and he, you know, consistently engaged in class. And, you know, the, the term relentless engagement and then with the very little detail, it just creates a kind of a negative image. Now there's nothing, I don't wanna freak you out because there's nothing much you can do about your uh, letter writers, except here you should have picked someone, two people who knew him better or you know, these are just, they're not helpful. Um, again, I would say if the rest of his application had been more positive, I don't know that this alone would concern me, but right now I'm feeling like, okay, I feel good about the decision I made. I don't see anything in here to give me pause and think that I was uh, too hasty in thinking he's not ready for law school. Hey everybody, it is Dean Z and now I'm in my office, why? because Dustin who, Dustin, who has a true commitment to excellence, told me that I needed to fix some stuff in here. Number one, I forgot to give this person a name. We're gonna call him Nathan. Stay tuned for more names and you can figure out where I'm pulling them from. But most importantly, Dustin says, I should have wrapped it all up and said, and not ended so abruptly and given you all, you know, a nice package of um, takeaways, right? So here's what uh, I want you to, be thinking about when you're thinking about why did this person who on the surface looks you know if you heard about him you'd think oh sure he must have gotten in everywhere didn't get in um two big categories of problems one tiny little errors you know unforced errors that all added up into an impression of um 
some sloppiness. Um, you know, so did you know? Didn't said he took the LSAT twice, but it was three times. He didn't give me any information about his father, and so on and so forth. But so, the, but those were minor. The, the main thing was just the overall um, tone of his essays were, was really problematic, and uh, there were the resume was really just lacking in the kind of information that we like to see. So I hope your takeaway from this is you actually have a lot of control over this application. The numbers are a starting point and they are not your destiny, whether for good or for ill. So the message from this should be encouraging. So, and also if you hear about someone not getting into law school who seemingly has great numbers or what have you, there may be, there may be more to that story. And it doesn't mean that they're a monster, but there may nonetheless be very good reasons why they didn't get admitted. All right, thank you for listening, and uh, I'm gonna say it again, wherever you go, go blue.